Welcome to In the Deep. I'm your host, Catherine Ingram. The following is excerpted from Dharma Dialogues held in June 2017 in Lennox Head, Australia. It's called Envy and Other Human Foibles. I also wanted to let you know that we're having a seven-day residential retreat in Umbria, Italy, in October of 2018. Uh, We've got just a few spots left for that retreat, so if you're interested, please call or write to me directly through the contact info on our website. Good evening and welcome. (laughs) We hear a lot in spiritual circles about compassion. We're encouraged in that direction. When someone is when you see someone suffering, there's a natural arising for many people. A suffering with, an empathy, an understanding, a concern. And compassion has a cousin, a beautiful cousin named sympathetic joy, mudita in Buddhist terminology. Sympathetic joy whereby your friend or someone you know is having some great success or something wonderful is happening in their life. And from a spiritual point of view, we're encouraged to feel sympathetic joy. Although it's not as easy to come by, is it? As compassion. Sometimes it's difficult to feel sympathetic joy for some people, many I would say. Easier to feel compassion, easier to feel when someone's having a hard time, easier to feel a welling up of empathy and concern. But when there's success, your friend is having success someone you know, it's a a bit harder for many, many people, which is natural, normal. If uh, you ever read any of the work of the primatologists who study, say, chimpanzees or baboons in the wild, you discover very quickly a lot of high drama goes on with regard to jealousy and (laughs) fighting. and (laughs) It's very highly programmed, this competitive nature we have. Very highly programmed, highly conditioned. The fact that it arises, the fact that things like that arise, whereby you don't feel particularly happy for your friend and their success... (laughs) You're not wishing them ill, just when these things arise, it's not a it's not a cause for you to feel ashamed or to feel that it shouldn't arise, or that somehow you've taken a wrong turn, you've done something wrong, you're not very spiritual, you're not very evolved. All of this is extraneous. These kinds of things arise for almost everyone. Now, we do know the difference. There are some people who have natural sympathetic joy. We know who they are of our friends, let's say. The one you can't wait to tell of your success or of your, the win, the little win you might have had. You, you know who those ones are that you know are going to be genuinely happy for you. And you might also know the ones you maybe will dim your success a little bit when you're speaking to them because you can feel a little agitation. You may still be good friends, but you notice that maybe you're not going to tell them of your latest, greatest thing. These are the little negotiations we make in relationships. But what do we do with the internal material as it arises. The material that arises in each of us 
I dare say, that we're not too happy with, that we're, there can be a self-judgment, especially if you've been in some way indoctrinated in spiritual belief systems that would, t- would tell you that somehow all of this material is being eradicated or should be eradicated, right? Our Buddhist, my Buddhist teachers used to say that the awareness purifies the mind. Well, I don't think so. Right? Now, the awareness can be, allow the mind to feel very free in its conditioning. Right? This idea of purifying the mind, purifying the thoughts, purifying the reactions, hopeless. Why not live in a total acceptance? I think I've told this story in here before, but it is illustrative of what I'm saying. Many years ago, I was teaching in Port, um, in Dublin, Dublin, Ireland. Um, maybe I'm remembering this story because Marianne and I, just on the way here, Marianne was telling me she's just returned from Ireland. Just, we were just, I was just remembering so many moments. Anyway, I was on my way into the city, into Dublin. I was staying outside of the city and I would take a train to go into the city, the train called Dart, the the fast train, called Dart, the Dublin Area Rapid Transit. And it is a little Dart. It's very, very fast. And it pulls into the station it just zooms into the station. They probably wouldn't allow it in America, actually. They don't, they're kind of, they're so litigious. And <laughs> anyway, it just zooms in and like, like a bullet and it stops. And then people, the doors open, people get off, people get on. I'm standing on the platform on my way into Dharma Dialogues. And I'm watching these trains going by. And, and I started thinking, if you wanted to kill yourself this would be a really effective way because, you know, they wouldn't, be, they wouldn't have time to stop. You would just jump off at the last minute and it would do the job probably. And then I was thinking, and it would be really easy to push one of those people off. <laughs> and then off I went to Dharma Dialogues. <laughs> so <laughs> you might think that that might have been rattling to me. But it wasn't at all, because I don't care what arises in my mind. I assume it's mad. I've lived with it a long time. And I don't take, uh, I don't take much responsibility for the content of the thoughts. Where I do apply some responsibility is in the actions that follow any thoughts, but mostly I let the thoughts go by. Mostly I don't bother with them. Mostly I assume that they're mad. And, and that... <laughs> and there's only a few ones that one needs to bother with. And like that, we get along very happily, my mind and I. <laughs> because I gave up a long time ago trying to purify it. And believe me, I did try. I, as many of you know, I was in I was in mindfulness practice for 17 years, beginning in 1974 and quitting in 1991, a long time ago. But I did do 17 years of pretty heavy duty practice, and watched my mind, and watched the thoughts, and watched the nonsense, and I lived in a circle of people in a community, in a sangha, in which there was the hope and we were taught that as you went along on what was called the progress of insight, certain things would fall away. 
certain bad things would fall away. You would, um, you know, you would no longer feel hatred or jealousy or even judgment, even comparing anything, um, anger. It, it was a promise that never came to be, and I never saw it. I never saw it in anybody else, frankly. So it was a great relief to let that go, let that expectation, even let that want go. It was an incredible belief, a relief. And since that time, it has felt freer and freer and freer because I really don't mind what my mind is doing. And so, for instance, I do find compassion arises easily. I find sympathetic joy is not as easy. That's just the truth of it. And I notice it when it ha- I notice that when it happens. I'll notice when something arises that reminds me of that. But again, I don't have any extra story on it. I see myself as a human creature with human conditioning. And as such, when there is that kind of relaxation around this kind of material, there's a, a, a gentleness that one feels toward one, one's own self. And you also have then understanding, easier access to understanding when you see others who perhaps are displaying these kinds of feelings and reactions. You know it well. Okay. If anyone has anything you'd like to discuss on these matters or similar matters, (laughs) please feel free. I had a realization through the week. It was just a moment, yeah. But that I measured my my consciousness in terms of how vital I felt in my body, in my oh. sense of vitality, oh. and so I got to recognize that maybe that's not the truth of it, and maybe even if I'm not feeling vital, it's okay. So there was just a, a moment where I wasn't so caught in the story of. Yeah. Or the cause and effect or something. Very good, yes. Mm. Excellent, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a... Who needs that extra interpretation, right? (laughs) Well, I figure as well that, um, you know, the truth is that, I I mean, I have... Everyone's got their own story with their physical stuff, but, you know, life goes on. And, I mean, being... If I measure how conscious I am through my vitality... Who am I going to be if I make it to 96? Right. I might not be feeling vital then, but I'll still be possibly alive, <laughs> you know? Um, and if does that mean that I'm there for a big failure? Where's the gap, you know, right. between... Yeah. Yes. So There's so much about the frame through which you're experiencing anything, mm. right? I mean, I know so many people who have, um, you know, what's often called chronic fatigue, although they tell me and I believe them that that's a very puny name for what it is, that it's actually quite a, you know, quite a debilitating uh, thing. Do you call it that here? Yeah. 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 And I guess it's called ME in Europe or something. Anyway, that it doesn't quite capture the full, (laughs) the full effect. Now, obviously, if, if one is afflicted with something like that, to add on a story that you're not really alive, right? That, that, you, that you're just missing life. It's just another torment, mm. right? Yeah. Another added suffering to the already existing physical suffering. Completely. Yeah. I really one of, got One that, of my yeah. girlfriends um, was in a terrible accident, a terrible car accident, many, many years ago, decades ago. Um, her back got broken 
and she has lived with pain ever since. Um, and she lives in London. And the last time I saw her, I was struck by how radiant she is. She's radiant. She has this, her eyes are blazing and she, she smiles a lot. And she's been living with pain all this time. She was in the hospital a long time. She was bedridden a long time. She was in physical therapy a long, long, long time. Um, and I've talked to her about this a number of times. Uh, and, you know, she, some, something shifted in her mm -hmm. that basically said, this is the what-so of my life, and I can either fight it mm -hmm. and be depressed and wish to die, or I can say, this is how it is, and this is my life. Mm -hmm. And so I talk a lot, and you've probably heard me talk, about dignifying the life that you have, right? Not being, not being tormented by this wish that your life was somehow different, somehow your life, uh, the, the, the one you're living isn't quite the one you're supposed to be living. <laughs> right? That There's another life out there somewhere, right? Or something that can happen with regard to your body or your mind or, or any fill in the blank. People have their postponement uh, plans well in place for waiting to live their life at some other point. <laughs> Um, but what if you said yes to your life exactly as it is? Mm -hmm. I have been really struggling with that idea mm -hmm. over the last week. And I think it was catalyzed through hearing somebody talking about purpose, this notion of purpose. And In Dharma Dialogues? Or I can't remember. Somewhere, if, yes. There was someone who spoke about not feeling like they completely... Um, were alive in in each moment, and that yes. was in Diamond Dialogues. Yes, and, it was. Yes. And then there was a follow-on conversation with a friend of mine who was talking about feeling like she was always unsettled because she knew she wasn't meeting her purpose oh. and this concept of purpose. I know. And, I, 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 yeah. It's one of my pet peeves that this whole thing of purpose. You know, it's it's. I mean, as soon as you bring it up, you start feeling nervous, right? <laughs> Completely. None, none of us have managed to fulfill our potential, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Except there's a few people who sort of went beyond theirs. <laughs> 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 but <laughs> but it, no, I, that's another one of the sort of new age tropes that goes around of, you know... You're realizing your potential and finding your life's purpose and you know it's a very it's almost mercenary somehow and what if you gave that one up right I always love you know I always love the lines like you know Jesus' line consider the lilies of the field you know they toil not and yet does anyone know the stanza it's so beautiful I don't know, Solomon in all his glory is not as beautiful as one of these. And that, you know, that, that it, it just being in your sweetness, right, and showing up in presence with those that you interact Vitality with. Vitality or lack of. <laughs> Either way, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's just a, an interpretation, right? It's maybe, right? Um, that that might be the most beautiful taste of this existence, right? All of this finding of purpose, um, much of it, I would say, is ego-driven. Ego Look at what it's done. Just have a gander in the news at what it's done in the, on the planet. All these people who want to, you know, make a name and leave something, you know of themselves, leave a mark, which really is a marring uh, on this poor planet, you know. Ha have a look at what it looks like. And think about the cultures where the highest, the highest good in their understanding was that when you left, you left no trace. Right? Think about the difference of that. 
You know, it was only until about 70,000 years ago um, that human animals were, there was basically no trace left when, when, they'd, when one died. Uh, they, were, they were basically not making any marks on the planet other than what the other animals, just a little bit, barely, right? It has been this thrust of, of uh, self-aggrandizement that has gone completely wacky, out of control, that has ensued over these many years of humans, of Homo sapiens, who were a very rough group. There were lots of other humans. It turned out we killed them all. Homo sapiens killed killed all the other ones. Even the Neanderthals were a really much more gentle group than Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens got rid of all of them. And, and are doing a good job of getting rid of everything else that's alive on the planet. And, um, and that's part of all of these kinds of notions. You know, the grandness of me, the wonder of me, you know, <laughs> my fabulous purpose, my fabulous potential, all of these things, you know. One of my friends... He wrote the book, The Art of the Deal. His name is on the cover with Trump's. He wrote it in the 1980s. But he actually wrote it. He thinks Trump read it. He's not positive that he did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he said nothing about that engagement. To, I mean, he told me about it a lot because I knew him at the time he was doing it. And he, was, he did it because it was a lot of money. Um, and he had a wife and two kids living in an apartment in New York City, and that changed his life in terms of the money. And at the time, Trump was just a real estate guy in New York. So anyway, time passed, but my friend Tony came out this past summer when he began to realize that this man might become the president of the United States. He began speaking out about about who he was and who he is. And uh, it was ve very brave of him and difficult. Um, I, and anyway, what I'm getting at is one of the things he has been saying recently is that the, the emptiness inside of Trump is so intense that now even in the presidency... It's only getting, it's only intensifying. Do you follow? He's now at the top of whatever, he's at the top job on the planet. And he's got all eyes looking at him, which is what he craved, according to my friend. Everyone's looking at him, everyone's talking about him. And the emptiness is intensifying. Do you follow? This is, a, this is an extreme case of someone finding their life's purpose. <laughs> and it's not enough because the problem is it, it, the, the emptiness is, is still there. And then once you're in that top job and you realize it's not fixed, then you have nowhere to go. So these are, these are notions, as I said, this is one of my pet peeves, um, because I look around and I watch how... How well that sells, you know, like the secret and all kinds of programs and all kinds of spiritual scenes and workshops and and like I said, it just seems mercenary. The happiest people real happiness is contentment. People who know how to appreciate, people who are you know, who who can just experience simple joys. Right? Doesn't have to be a big grand thing. If those come along, they're welcome, but it doesn't have to be that.
we can be just, you know, you just start to attune to small joys and beautiful connections. And that's how one feels more and more a sense of abundance. It's not adding on to the me story. That is never going to do it. Never. In Buddhism, there's something called the hungry ghost realm. It refers to a particular kind of hell where the image of, it's also called the, the petaloka. The image is the, um, these creatures that have these enormous bellies and a tiny pinhole of a mouth. So no matter how they try, how hard they try, they can't get fed. They can't get any sustenance in. So there's a constant hunger. Hungry ghosts, right? It's an incredible, powerful image, hungry ghosts. And we know people who are like hungry ghosts. They just can't get fed. They can't get full, like I was saying about Donald Trump. Punjaji once said something very brilliant. Many things he said were brilliant. But he, he was talking about being a beast of burden for your desires. Like, like it's like the desires are driving you like a beast of burden, like, like a donkey being whipped along. Right, and it's like go get that now, go get that now, go get that now, go get that. And then he said, the interesting part is that often when you when you get the object of desire or have the experience that you desired, the relief you're feeling is in the cessation of the desire. <laughs> <laughs> it's not in the object. It's in the cessation of the desire. I mean, you might have a little bit of pleasure in the object initially or in the experience, but, but also it was like that, that thing that was driving you along, that, that, that burning wanting that was going along. And now you get to have that come to a, 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 a cessation because you got the object. Except that if the hunger is still running for whatever reason now you're going to think of a new desire to chase another you're going to be a beast of burden again now that is not to say that all desires are bad I'm not saying that obviously we're human animals and we have desires and we're supposed to have desires but one becomes again discerning about how you play it how what you're doing with chasing desire are some of them are not worth chasing right a lot of them aren't and you become also very clear i talked about this recently that every desire comes with a tax a tax of energy a tax of upkeep right whether it's a relationship or a new car whatever <laughs> it is right it's going to have first of all you if it's a, if it's an object you've got to work Unless you're just inherited wealth, you've got to work a number of hours to get the money to buy that car. So there's an exchange of energy already at the, at the get-go. And then there's also the, all the upkeep of it and all the an ancillary things that go with any object or anything, a house or anything. And the same with, an, with a relationship. They, they require maintenance, right? <laughs> so you become very clear on that some desires you're going to play with, you're going to dance with, you're going to celebrate. And some you can let go and let peace reign in your house, right? Just you become more easily content. Little simple joys, like I've been saying. Often people have a sense that they're um, that something out there, some big thing out there, is going to transform their life. You know, if only that big thing would happen. And I think that is what drives a lot of people. And it is the it is the cultural um, hallucination that is happening. 
<laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I've got an afterthought. Sure. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's so quiet. I'm so glad because I didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was. It was related to how you were speaking when you opened and I thought for me it, there is this a jealousy thing so I'm sure it's ego driven but it, particularly I can be so um, excited about friend success if it's not in my field when it's up here right that's when it hits so there's this exactly. jealousy aspect yeah. that comes well, in. It, it could also be something to do with if if I look at it from an evolutionary point of view or watch the animals that our, our relatives. Um, it also could have to do with self-preservation. That basically, you know, if there is scarcity, then you know some portion of the you know food source or whatever it was, the mate or whatever, got taken. And so there's that part of it as well. So anyway, go ahead. Oh no, that's it. It's just more the, um, that that's something that I definitely have gone into struggle with for myself um I definitely feel like I'm I go in between the less than for feeling it and then the oh I'm mightier kind of aspects yeah um so I guess I was just bringing that up for yeah and I'm sure you speak for many in this room and it's a very common thing it's a very common feeling and um it's uh, you know and it and it has a kind of uh Actually, I noticed for me, yeah, um, it's woven into almost like a poor me victim thing. So that's my patterning a little bit. That um, I don't know. It's like there's a self righteousness and there's a poor me. So they're the, my two bits yeah. that I bounce through. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know yeah, if everyone yeah. else, but <laughs> and so here's the here's the good news about it. What? So what? <laughs> right. You know, I mean, that's just a patterning. That's just a conditioning, you know. When I say that I really don't care about what arises in my, believe me, if, if, if my mind were being broadcast, uh, except for the selective little bits that I'm telling you, <laughs> you'd be horrified. <laughs> but most of it, I'm, it's filtered out. It's just... You know, background spam. It's I don't care, and so like that. And there are certain types of conditioning that are stronger due to whatever uh, life circumstances, genetics, things that happen, parents, etc. Um, you know, I, I I'm really at the point, mercifully in my life and have been for quite a long time where I'm just really okay with it, you know. And I also notice, just in terms of my preferences, that I really like hanging out with people who are in touch with their shadow and are in touch with, you know, I, I love the line by Alan Watts, Divine Rascals. You know, I like, I like hanging out with the rascals and <laughs> people who are authentic in those ways, you know, who are honest and who can really get down about stuff they're going through or things, something they felt or just kind of, you know, put it out in the room and laugh about it together, you know, and live in that kind of freedom. I find it very, very oppressive when I'm around a holy roller, <laughs> you know, someone who's, everything's a little too precious. And you just suspect there's a lot going on there that is under the rug, you know. Often that's actually where I go into my jealousy and the what if, and oh, I'm not quite holy enough. <laughs> But it's fine. <laughs> I don't know if I believe it. It just comes sometimes. <laughs> right. But is that based on seeing people you think are... Oh, no, it's just no. a moment. Oh, I was yeah, just yeah. commenting. Okay. It's just yeah. a moment thing. It's yes. not a big thing. Yeah, yeah well, those are, the kinds of th those are the kind of feelings that actually can be really let go easily. Yeah. Those kinds of, you know, things of being spiritual and, you know, 
And instead, one is just being a lot more true. And at the same time, there's a kind of a freeing that starts to happen when you're basically just saying yes to you as you are. And you're a lot more loose with other people as well. Let them be themselves as well. You may not want to cho choose to hang out with some of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> but at the very least, there's a certain, you know, authenticity that's happening. And, and like that, it just gets more real. As someone who's completely new to these talks, if you have any tips for cultivating that ambivalence of the mind, to the mind, sorry, not okay. of the mind, to the mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, some of it is simply uh, redirecting the attention. So uh, that's a very easy way to do it. Um, when there's troubling things, when there's a kind of stream of neurotic thought that's just starting to drive you crazy, then let that be a, dhar a dharma bell in and of itself that pulls you to, you know, you could use little cues to yourself, like go to, I say to often to myself, go to quiet, you know, or you could say snap out of it, <laughs> um, let it go, or just whatever that kind of interrupts, says to yourself, I don't really want to be obsessed in this. I don't want to have this taking up my whole screen of awareness. So then you're basically moving your awareness. You don't have to move it far. All you have to move it into is reality. It's always waiting for you. So you move it into reality. Here you are in present awareness. Right? And usually, almost always... When you move it into present awareness, into your sense doors, into just this, almost always it's pretty good. It's fine. There are times that it's not. There are times that our attention wants to flee in certain circumstances. If you're being beaten, or you're being raped, you're being chased, you're being whatever, or you've just had terrible news. Uh, you've just gotten the terrible news. Okay, we leave aside there are some times when the attention goes numb or, or wants to escape or does escape, disembodies. And maybe that's good in those moments. Um, but they're few and far between for most people. A lot of what happens is we spend a lot of time, you know, worried and in fear and in neurotic madness and so on when the moments we were experiencing were perfectly fine, except for that. So this is a kind of discernment that starts to kick in, whereby you develop a taste for, hey, it's kind of easy, really, right now, in fact. You just get sort of true about what's happening. And then when the mind starts running down its old tracks... And you find there's a lot of attention on it. It's not a problem if it's running down the old tracks and you're not paying much attention. But when it's running down those old tracks and it is calling you and, you know, kind of making you sick, use that. Use, let it be an ally and say to yourself, wow, this is nuts. Let me go back to living here. Let me go back to my beautiful moment that's here waiting and I'm not suggesting you impose anything uh, like some, you know, enhanced picture. Just regular old beautiful life, right? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to Photoshop it. No, no. No. And, and to really start to taste it that way, start to taste the... Um, just the sweetness of that simplicity of being. And then you just find, I often say, like, there's so many little joys in life that you're sort of tripping over them, you know? Um, there's this, <laughs> this great thing online. It's called The Dog Diary and the Cat Diary. Do you know it? Does anyone know it? It's really hilarious. You could look it up. But anyway, <laughs> The Dog Diary is all through the day, it's like, 
A walk. Wow. My favorite thing. <laughs> the people put out water. Wow. My favorite thing. And it goes on and on, even all, to, all the way to the night. Watching TV with the people. My favorite thing. Well, then it goes to the cat. <laughs> The cat diary, which is extremely different, but I won't go into the cat diary, which is hilarious. Um, but in a way, it's like you become like you're wagging your tail through the day, you know, that that it's like, oh, you get up and you get to have whatever, your coffee or your smoothie or whatever it is, you know, wow, it's nice, you know, it's great. And, you know, you go for a walk and you feel, I mean, especially around here, you know, you live in beauty, you know, spectacular beauty, breathtaking beauty, um, world class. You know, so you just rather than just sort of take it for granted and just another day, you're 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 awake to it. You know, you're you're seeing it and appreciating, even just in a very simple way, just that you're experiencing a peaceful circumstance. You know, and like that, tasting your food, or you go to the markets and you look at what's this abundance that's just here and. You know, you go to Santos and there's everything that you could need or want and more than that. And on and on like that through the day, you know, and you, you know, you talk to your friend and it, it's so nice to just look into each other's eyes and have a real conversation. It doesn't have to even be deep. It can just be anything. And like that, you, you start to channel your attention intelligently rather than let it run willy-nilly on its own conditioning, you in, you're intelligently directing your attention. And that becomes like a habit. It does become a habit. And even though occasionally you dip into neurosis and you get afraid or you get jealous or you have all these things, you discover that they don't last as long as they used to. You don't dip into the old mud as long as you used to. Right? You, I like to say you have a holy haunting, a different kind of haunting that starts to, when you're lost, there's something that starts pulling you. Right? And in an evening like this, we're basically sitting in it. We're sitting in that ease of being. We're sitting on that frequency. We're steeping, steeping in it. And as that gets stronger, just through being in it, it becomes more the default position of your attention. It becomes more where your attention tends to hang out more. And it doesn't ever have to be constant. That's another mistake people make. They think they're, oh, well, then I'm going to end up enlightened if this keeps up. (laughs) (laughs) But I I don't subscribe to that notion and I don't think it's useful uh, to have that, even that hope. It doesn't have to be constant. It can just be frequent. That's good enough. Yes. So, I have a little bit a mess in my head, and I'm all the time thinking, "Oh, I never will get it." And then, then this the voice comes. Nya, 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 nya. There's nothing to get. Yeah. So, but you know, it's difficult to say. I'm. I'm really have the feeling. I'm. I am blockade, stuck. I'm stuck. Because, but it, maybe you're only stuck because you think there's something else to get or be. Or yeah, yeah, I know. I I think it, like you talked before, waiting. Yeah, there's something to get, and I know there's nothing to get. But even so, <laughs> <laughs> and we talk so much with Rama, you know, because I think he get it, and I don't. <laughs> And I'm glad for him, you know? Yeah. It's not like... You have Arr. sympathetic joy for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this case, yes. In this case. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so yeah, it, it's very difficult actually to explain, but I'm so frustrated actually, you know. Mm. I'm really, uh, and I, I feel helpless in this. And yeah, there's many choice in my day. Yes. There's good. many choice yes. and I'm not a completely frustrated, negative person. But I think I'm I mean, can you, I mean, really, can you just simply give up any idea of a spiritual search or life or any kind of identity having to do with anything spiritual? <laughs> like, just really get down to just this ordinary, simple, just basic, really basic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but behind there is this, you yeah. know, like... Well, you know, okay. It's, yeah. But it, let's say that's the conditioned thing. You mm. were spiritually conditioned. 17 years of Zen practice mm. and then Advaita and your love of Ramana and some kind of maybe hope that snuck in there that all of this would lead to something. <laughs> but, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then you and then you have the people that say, "Oh, I'm not the body. I'm not the body," and I don't also believe that. Oh, you know? yeah, me That's neither. really oh, yeah, oh, right. la, la. All you have to do is pinch one of them and. It... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, or oh, the mountain. The mountain will make it for me. You know, left, I, I, I think I think one of the things you're you're experiencing, if I may say, I may be wrong, but is. Um, you know, th that all of that time that you logged in as a relatively young person all through your, you know, that was heavy-duty conditioning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, there's worse conditioning out there to be had, certainly, but that was a kind of conditioning. Mm. That, and I had it too. Um, you know, I had it too, which is what I'm saying tonight. Um, this is what I would love to see you be free of. All idea, all your spiritual ideas have none. Just mm. yeah, would yeah. like you know, like just like wow, a clear, clear. You no, know? but even uh, yeah. So what that there's a chattering that goes through. Mm. Not even having a fight with that, but just don't bother listening to it. Don't believe it anymore. Mm. Right. That there's something that you're not getting, that there's something else, that there's some way that some, you know, like I said the other day, I think you were there in Lennox, uh, you know, as though there's some secret lock and if you just had the right key. Ah, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know? yeah. And it, it's not that. It's mm. it, all the things that the great ones have told us and they told us in every tradition all turns out to be exactly true in terms of the ordinariness of this that, you know, the earth where you stand is the pure lotus land, right? And that the kingdom of heaven is within, and that the musk deer searches the world over for the source of its own scent, and on and on it goes, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I would like to let go of all this. It's like, you know, it, it feels like, oh, it's like a, a black bowl, you know, and I would like to just let go, but then, and then, then there is this, come, the, comes these thoughts in, oh, don't believe the mind, don't believe your thoughts, you know, it's all this conditioning is there, I see that, but I don't know how. Well, what I would suggest is what I said earlier, is just redirect your attention when mm -hmm. all that, whenever that material is arising, redirect your attention into your ordinary existence mm -hmm. here in the moment, here and now, things you've heard, but just make it simple and ordinary, mm -hmm. having no expectation of any glamorous insight, right? Mm -hmm. You've had enough. You've probably had several lifetimes of your share. Because <laughs> doing Zen practice all those years and being in the monastery and, and just, you know, thousands of conversations like this, you've had, you've, you've looked at this plenty. You've got the picture. 
right? There's just something extra that's in there that I would suspect is spiritual conditioning mm-hmm. that thinks it's something other than this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what if it isn't? What if this is it? And then all the Advaita? Forget all that. I, I, leave all of that. Okay. Leave it all. All of it. Mm. Right. Because People, I never will get it. Really, the Advaita, not for me, but for some reason. It's not for me either. I get labeled as an Advaita teacher, not by me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but <laughs> I just can't get it. It's, I, it's a little too transcendent for me. For, mm. I, I just find it, it's like, huh? <laughs> yeah, me too. I, it, it's just like, yeah, yeah, okay. Right. Voila. Let's keep it really simple and basic and mm-hmm. real and ordinary and speaking you know do you know who Martin Luther King Jr. was he was an American um, leader of the civil one of the civil rights leaders of America beautiful beautiful guy I mean really a Dharma brother you know and whenever he would speak his congregation well, he's a black guy whenever he would speak his congregation would be shouting out, say it plain, Martin, say it plain. Because <laughs> he did say it plain. He did say it beautifully plain. Anybody could understand it. And it was so powerful a message that even the white people started hearing it, you know. And um, so, you know, it's like you just get really more and more plain. And you speak in regular language, you know. And you set aside all of this... Whenever I, th- I have observed this, not just in spiritual domains, but in other domains as well, when things get co-opted over time, you know, they, they really get degraded, right? So sometimes you have a spark of a, of a brilliant blaze of a person, a genius of some sort, a spiritual genius or a mathematical genius or a an artist of some sort or literature, you know. And then people get inspired by it and they start sort of copying it in their own inauthentic way, just trying to copy. And it never really looks as good (laughs) as it did in the original. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know, so why not truly have this taste of this existence in your totally authentic way? Mm-hmm. And leave aside naming it, and leave aside all the concepts. You know, just leaving them, even if they arise as conditioned mind, mm-hmm. which they might. Mm-hmm. D- go, keep going back to what is my own actual taste here, and then you start to speak from that, and it has a freshness. It has the ring mm-hmm. of. Mm-hmm originality for one thing which I'm sure you appreciate Um, and you can hear when you hear it yeah and you know when you're saying it and this is what this would be my wish for you Mm, me too yeah This has been In the Deep. You can find the entire list of In the Deep podcasts at katherineegram.com, where you can also book a private session by phone or Skype, see the schedule for Dharma Dialogues and Retreats, or make a tax-deductible donation in support of this work. Till next time. <laughs>